Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Perry. I am the Global Social Impact Manager at Ripple. I am part of our Ripple Impact team, which is responsible for uh, programs like our University Blockchain Research Initiative, our work and commitments around sustainability and expanding financial inclusion. Um, and all of that we do through our partnerships with global NGOs and um, our academic partners. So. I'm super excited to be here. This is actually my first time at Apex, and uh, it's been great meeting so many of you, learning more about the XRPL ecosystem and all of the uh, incredible projects that are being built. Um, I think there's a lot uh, of opportunity for uh, more solutions around the topics that we're going to be talking today to be built by some of um, uh, the incredible developers and entrepreneurs uh, already building on the XRPL. Um, I am uh, joined by Jen Block um, and Ken Ko. Uh, Jen was uh, a part of the Regen cohort of the XRPL Commons residency, and Ken is the head of Venture Labs at Mercy Corps Ventures, uh, the impact investing arm of Mercy Corps, the global development organization. So um, thank you both so much for, for being here and, and joining us. Uh, before we get going, I, I just want to kind of set the stage, um, so to speak. But uh, you know, why we're talking about this is because globally, uh, there's about 1.4 billion people who are unbanked in the world. Uh, this means that they don't have access to a bank account, of course. It also means they don't have access to savings, to credit, uh, to uh, investing, to all of the financial services that we tend to take, uh, uh, take for granted. Um, Women are disproportionately excluded, and there was, I think, a, a narrative early on that crypto was kind of going to, to save this, to change this, maybe even overnight. And that hasn't quite happened, but the needle is starting to move, uh, and it's moving in emerging markets, I think, in a lot of ways, thanks to the entrepreneurs, the companies that are building Web3 solutions um, to financial services, uh, also to uh, preparing for climate change and climate solutions. Those two things are actually more connected than, uh, than they sound, and we're going to talk a bit about that. But um, So to get us going, um, I would love for Jen to start us off and, and talk about your experience at the XRPL Commons residency and the concept that you have developed that's come out of that. Okay. So the XRPL um, Commons Aquarium is based in Paris, an amazing space um, where I was able to um, start a new project uh, in the XRPL ecosystem. Um, we were the first cohort focusing on sustainability with an amazing team that were, was there to just help us and give us you know, very good insights. So um, as an outcome, of this um, residency, I started COSIAL. And COSIAL is um, a project that is um, helping development banks to experiment with blockchain. So basically, on one hand, I have identified that development banks um, are not development banks anymore. <laughs> now they are becoming climate banks. And they are all linked to governments, and governments have asked development banks, and especially a very big network of them, to use their power, which represents around 12% uh, of global investment, in order to leverage the 85% remaining and uh, to um, climate funding. Why? Because we are today, as you probably have heard, investing five times less than what we need yearly in order to get to something closer to um, carbon um, neutral, not neutral, I mean, to all the target of 2030, 2050. <laughs> and and um, so they have this problem, and they try, they set up meetings. Um, on the other hand, you have the private sectors that is needs to be more and more compliant to regulation, and need to um, invest into uh, reliable um, projects toward the climate transition. And they are missing these projects. And they are missing also the trust. So um, by um, setting up 
a platform and helping development banks to tokenize their program and um, that they are building and they are funding themselves and to set up a platform where you can have public private uh, funding of this program along the collection of impact data, that's an amazing tool to really and seriously help these development banks do what they are required to do. Yeah. So basically, this is Cosial. Thank you. Um, and you're also sort of describing a, a financing gap, which is uh, also something that Mercy Corps Ventures uh, tries to address with their investment portfolio uh, and pilots uh, of companies in emerging markets. So Ken, can you tell us about uh, your role at Mercy Corps Ventures and uh, the Crypto for Good Fund? Sure. So uh, Mercy Corps Ventures, we are an impact investment fund that's based out of an NGO called Mercy Corps, a house in the US. Uh, what we do is we invest in early stage startups across emerging markets, which is defined as Africa, Latin America, and Asia, uh, who are working, at, uh, working on solutions in fintech, agritech, and climate tech. Uh, we've invested in about 50 companies to date, and uh, half of our portfolio is female founded. Now, uh, the work that I lead is uh, it's on our venture lab, which is testing first of a kind technology to see how um, innovative solutions can be deployed to address financial and climate resilience in these emerging markets. And uh, to date, we've launched 15 pilots. We've run uh, all on crypto, so just testing different Web3 use cases in emerging markets, uh, 10 different countries across the global south. Uh, we've also been working at the intersection with climate resilience and also using humanitarian use cases. So we've also got a humanitarian lab, which is testing how we can deploy stable coins and other technologies like that to, uh, to help alleviate humanitarian crises around the world. You have a lot of exposure and understanding to these founders and the problems. Um, and I think this is becoming a, it's becoming clear that, you know, the sort of age old saying that the people who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solutions. Um, and that's what we're seeing with some of the really creative utilizations of blockchain, uh, both in climate uh, resilience and financial resilience, whether that's tokenizing assets uh, to make them more affordable, or that's utilizing a stable coin as a form of savings when you don't have access to that. Um, what are some of the trends that either of you are seeing uh, in these markets among builders and people using blockchain for good? Do you want, I, do yeah, absolutely. I, I, start. I, I mean, I think that one of the important thing is of, um, you know, blockchain is decentralization. So suddenly, you know, we are not thinking about something that is uh, you know, with global companies from Western countries, now we are able, and this is really good for sustainability actually, to build from anywhere and to go from peer to peer. So this is a cultural shift, but it's huge in terms of potential. So, you know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, bankarization and the, the need for finance services. You have a lot of blockchain companies that are targeting that. Um, and I'm sure Mercy Corp has, you know, a lot of projects. Um, the uh, one um, initiative that I found super interesting, one trend is what we call decentralized MRV. It's a MRV, so measuring, reporting, verification, is the fact of collecting the data that prove the impact of your activity. And today you pay a lot of money to a lot of intermediaries and uh, the uh, local um, producer, whatever is the product, is not benefiting from the fact that they are able to prove the, uh, the, benef the impact of uh, their activity. So um, decentralized MRV is possible because of you know the use of uh, satellites and the use of IoT and uh, uh, also AI of course but it's a way to create value for local people for local businesses and for SMEs and for me is a it is a future of uh, fair trade actually this is the future I hope of trade in general but of fair trade so that's one aspect that uh, I, I found super exciting and you have some Today, you already have a few uh, companies experimenting there. Awesome. Yeah, so with our Crypto for Good Fund, uh, over the past, we've run this for three years now. We've received over 500 different applications. Um, I would say over the, like, the trends that we've noticed over this time period, one is that, like, and this is like, you know, we launched this three years ago, right? So it's like peak of the bull, and then last year is like, you know, the winter. And I think 
over this time, we've noticed that applications are definitely getting better and they're getting closer to real world problems. So I think we're getting to a point where you're actually seeing like building like solutions for like people who actually require like financial new financial products or access to financial services or or climate resilient services. So I think it's one. Uh, so you're seeing like um, yeah, as you were saying, like you know, building solutions that are actually solving problems for people and building in a way that's like locally led and and done in a way that's responsible uh, for end users. Um, we're also seeing a lot of uh, multi-chain and cross-chain behavior. Um, so in this most recent cohort. Um, Founders or builders are already live on multiple chains and then with the intention of being live on at least three chains uh, So that's a really common thing that we've noticed uh, with the with the recent uh, building activity coming across um, And then in terms of some of the use cases that I think are, are emerging deep in is one I think a big one is real-world assets and tokenization Which I think has been talked about a lot here, and I know we'll talk about a bit more later um, Cross-border trade so the utiliza utilization of stable coins uh, to send money between various countries uh, we're seeing a lot of that sort of application, like a lot of between like Africa and Asia. Um, and then, yeah, I think lastly, maybe it's around the like consumer wallets and ramps as a way to onboard users into like the next billion users into Web3. So, so staying with you for another minute, um, you know, I think there's some of the pilots that you're running, um, investments that you're making in, in these companies, I think are proving that we're moving beyond that hype that I was, I was talking about. And um, Ajara is one of those companies that you ran a pilot with, um, tokenizing government bonds to make them more accessible uh, and affordable for, uh, as a savings mechanism. Uh, we'd love to hear more about that, that pilot, the results, potential for, uh, for scalability. Yeah, so the background here is that like, if you are like a middle class Cameroonian, um, your options, so first of all, in Cameroon, 9% of individuals or 9% of adults have actually uh, saved money at a financial institution. So I mean, contrast that to Europe, North America, obviously it's orders of magnitude different. Um, and so typically your options, if you ha say have a bit of money, um, put it under the mattress, uh, but you have 6.5% annual inflation, so you're just losing money by doing that. Um, you can give it to like someone at the market, like a market vendor, and they'll hold it onto you, but that's a negative interest rate. You're paying them to hold it for you. Um, so I mean, you really don't really have great options. The other one is you can put it into like a rotating savings group, but then that's not flexible, right? Because then it's your turn every like three months or six months. So if you have an emergency, it's harder to get access to that. Um, so typically you don't really have like good products uh, to allow you to save well. Um, one product that exists, I mean, I think for us, like, in what's called like I guess, the global north is that you could buy treasuries, right? You go on Robinhood, you can buy like a treasury, you get 5% today. Uh, very straightforward because fractionalization exists. But the Central Bank of Cameroon, the smallest denomination of a bond is 1 million CFA, which is about like 1,600 US dollars. You can't fractionalize that. And then there's also regulatory requirements where you need to have an, you need to be an asset manager to buy these bonds. And so the partner that we worked with in Cameroon uh, called Ijara, they have one of those licenses and then they worked together with the central bank of Cameroon to buy bonds, um, tokenize them and then fractionalize them and sell them through their consumer wallet. So that way anyone who had this app was able to park any excess capital and yield six, eight percent, like whatever it may be at that moment. Um, so yeah, we ran this pilot last year uh, 11,000 people opted in or like saved money. Over $250,000 was saved. And about half of the people were accessing a savings product for the first time. So it was a pretty uh, cool tokenization use case where uh, you can leverage blockchain technology and fractionalize like a very expensive product and do it down to, they were doing it down to one one thousandth. So you could buy it for $1.60, like denominations of that size. Yeah, thanks. Um, and so, when you complete these pilots, you have all this data that is helpful for, for building support, for scaling up, and that's something uh, Jen is really uh, focused on as well with her project. Um, can you talk more about, uh, I mean, impact tokenization, I think was the term that you were using in your proposal, and um, uh, how you're, you're using data to, uh, to demonstrate to development banks that these, these projects uh, are worth funding? Yeah, so, so um, what we want to do is um, doing the tokenization and, and um, 
working with existing infrastructure that are you know, providing financial tools for the tokenization of the programs. For example, you have um, uh, solar energy that need to be funded. And so um, uh, uh, what does a, a platform based on the blockchain would help you know, in terms of having uh, the possibility to co-fund uh, public-private, in terms of having the possibility to have um, um, a different type of portfolio that are according to your sustainability strategy as an investor. But one important thing, as I said, is the fact that you really want the proof also of your um, um, uh, impact investment. And so this is about collecting the data that are proving you know, along the time, at the beginning, during the project, and uh, at the end of the project, at the end of the construction of the project, that uh, you are really providing some uh, um, you know, in terms of social, environmental, or biodiversity uh, impact. So there's different ways to collect this data. Uh, we we are looking at what exists today. Um, there's several initiatives this way. What is important and what we are really focusing on is how it's going to benefit institutional investors. Because at this level, the project is business to business and it is about embarking institutional private investors to co-invest with development banks. So we are trying to figure out how it relates and how we can connect it to the regulations you know, yeah. for them. Um, it's really interesting. And do you think, this is a question for either of you, do you think that the narrative is sort of shifting around blockchain and climate? I feel like it's, you know, it's always kind of been uh, sort of a, a negative connotation, right, between uh, blockchain and energy usage, much of that misunderstood. Um, and then you've got chains like XRPO, which are very low energy use. Um, and but beyond that, you're seeing actual use cases like carbon credit tokenization. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're seeing that, that narrative shift amongst uh, the climate world and their views of blockchain? Um, so do I, do I go on? Yeah, yeah feel free. So, so um, thinking, of, you know, if I'm building off what we heard at lunchtime when Mélanie Damour did, um, uh, run the workshop around um, the impact of um, the XRP ledger, I really think that as a community, our biggest impact is by what we are building, you know, as builders, as anyone, even if you are not focusing on sustainability, if you're getting aware of what you could do in your action or with your real world impact that would emphasize some positive impact in terms of social or environmental um, aspect, that's where actually where as a community our impact is builder. XRP Ledger is already very, you know, very uh, um, good in terms of impact. Uh, we, we heard it very precisely at lunchtime. Um, and where I think we can really do something very strong is as a community of builders. And then in terms of I mean, I come from sustainability. I've been working with businesses um, for years around how they can get um, sustainability strategies. And I was so enthusiastic when I discovered the blockchain technology because for me it was, wow, this is a technology that exactly is able to tackle climate change challenges. And it's not only about the possibility of traceability, which is super important, and transparency, of course. And of course it is important because the value of the data, the proof that you can have much more reliable thanks to this type of technology of your impact is going to take more and more value in the future. It's very small, we are so much in the beginning of that. But it's also the fact that you can program some money, you can create a token that is buying only 100% recycled uh, products, for example, and this is just an idea like that. And another very important aspect for sustainability is the stakeholder engagement. The fact that we need to work with different type of stakeholders, with local communities, with you know, um, companies, uh, with NGOs, all together to achieve these goals. And for that, being able to set up, for example, a DAO, or being able to incentivize and automatize the incentivization of the different contribution, this is also super helpful with this type of technology. Yeah, I can give you an example of something that we worked on. Um, 
So today or this year, 299 million people in the world need humanitarian aid. Um, about $200 billion is actually spent on humanitarian aid every year. But only 1% of that is used to reduce or manage risks or like, like preventively uh, avoid humanitarian disasters. So everything is done um, post, post fact. Uh, why is this the case? I mean, generally because of like human behavior, right? Like we don't respond to something unless it happens. Like we don't plan ahead. Like that's kind of just how we are. Um, but it's like, but does this have to be the case, right? Like, do we actually need to work like this? And in fact, there's, there's a body of research that's growing that says that if you give someone money before a disaster hits, so before a storm hits or a flood or a drought, um, it's a seven to one ROI because they can actually invest in supplies or they can fortify their house or they can you know, buy food, bring, move their kid, move their pasture, move their livestock. So that way, when, this, when the disaster hits, they're not as immediately affected or not as drastically affected. So it's a huge ROI if you can actually give that money beforehand. And what's happening now is that with the advancements in satellite data, with remote sensing, with AI, you can predict half of humanitarian crises. Like you can today, given all the data that we have and we've crunched, we know when a lot of these, like, emergencies are going to happen. Um, so if you leverage you know, that aforementioned technology and you figure out how can you get that money out there faster and sooner, then you can greatly shift the landscape of humanitarian aid. So a pilot that we ran in the Horn of Africa, it was um, we were measuring the likelihood of a drought. And if this drought hit, we wanted to make payments via stablecoin to pastoralists so that they could get the money beforehand, and then you know, move their livestock, buy supplies, buy feed, buy food for themselves, whatever it is, right? Just give them money unconditionally so that they can make the decision on what they need to do. Um, so using satellite imagery, uh, we monitored, monitored vegetation data as a way to proxy uh, how much rainfall had fallen in that area, so whether a drought was gonna happen. And so before the, the dry season began, we could make a determination and then Using that data, we put in an oracle, um, triggers a smart contract, and then the stable coins are immediately released. So rather than um, industry best practice is like you respond within like seven to 14 days, like we could respond in, in hours, minutes, right? Like it's a smart contract, so it releases the funds as soon as you want it to release it programmatically. Um, instead of using uh, traditional rails to send money, like 10, 10%, let's say, five, 10%, depending on how much you're sending, um, you can do this with a stable coin, off-ramp it to mobile money for two to one five percent. So we are seeing speed increases of 90%. We are seeing transaction cost improvements of 75%. And it's just by leveraging blockchain, stable coins, some AI, uh, remote sensing data, and you're able to uh, greatly improve the resilience of people who are affected by climate change in, in these regions. I love how you just downplayed that by saying just by leveraging those. You know. <laughs> Straightforward. Four amazing things, yeah. Um, I, that's such a, a, an incredible example. You know, this is titled Building Both Financial and Climate Resilience, but that's like such a perfect intersection between those two, um, uh, between those two topics and issues. And I mean, curious how, how either of you would actually define climate resilience. Um, you mean there's two words there, climate and resilience. <laughs> um, I mean, first, uh, um, you know, I think climate is also a word first, more than, th there's a disruption. There's, we, we can talk about many other things. We can talk about the fact of what it means when, you know, when you produce value, are we able to um, include all the cost out of this value. I mean, it has not been account, uh, accountabilized until now. Like, if a, you are a big company, you have your balance sheet at the end, the cost of pollution, for example, or the social cost of your activity is not part of your um, um, balance sheet. And the things about uh, the, what we can do with valuing financially the extra financial asset, which actually should be financial asset, they shouldn't be extra financial asset, you know, is a way to have a better, uh, what we call regenerative, you know, to, to have a definition of value 
for our projects that is closer to the definition of value for an e a regenerative ecosystem. We, we need to get this idea of what regeneration is into the way we are building our infrastructures. And this is not by chance that in the blockchain ecosystem, the sustainability projects are called REFI, regenerative finance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, climate resilience is really hard. It's very contextually driven, right? So like a farmer in Nigeria has different needs for climate resilience than a farmer in the Netherlands versus a Boda Boda driver versus you know whoever it is. So it's, it's really tricky, but at Mercy Corps Ventures, what we do try to do is, the way that we've just defined climate resilience is uh, an individual's ability to prepare, adapt, and then recover from any climate shock. So as long as they have the tools in place, whether it's insurance or drought resistant seeds, like if they have those pieces in place, then it allows them to effectively prepare, adapt, and then recover from if there's any um, climate emergencies or climate disasters. Thank you. Well, we're into the negative numbers now, um, flashing before us in red that you can't see, uh, but it is very alarming. Uh, so uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. We could talk about this uh, honestly all day, and there's so many great um, use cases from, from both of our, our panelists here. Uh, if you're building on, on XRPL, um, you know, my, my one message to all of you is start thinking, you know, are, are you thinking about uh, vulnerable populations and how your tools could be built to uh, solve some of the problems that we were, we were talking about today? And so if you want to find some time with me or, or Ken or Jen, um, please do. And, and thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Thank you.